please give a warm welcome to Dr. Tamitha Scove. Hi there. I, I have to admit it's, it's a real honor to be uh, asked and invited here to speak with you guys today. Um, and you'll understand that, why that's so important to me uh, here in just a second, as soon as I load these charts. Actually, I, I guess I can start out with, uh, with asking you, how many of you here have ever heard about space weather? <laughs> oh, okay. How, how many of you have never heard of space weather? Oh, maybe one in the room? Okay. <laughs> I, I think I'm done. I guess I can just go. <laughs> no, it's fantastic that all of you know about space weather. You should know us about space weather because as ham radio ops, you guys are on the front lines of space weather, and I honestly bow to you every single day. And you'll understand even more of that here in a minute. I had a question asked of me just, yet, just last night. Gosh, are we the only people who really look at your videos, who actually care about space weather and how it affects things on a daily basis? And actually, the answer is a big no. I'm going to just put this screen up here so you can kind of see who is impacted by space weather and why. Now, of course, you guys are up here on the left-hand side. You know, the ham radio, op, you amateur radio operators, you are definitely on the front lines because you basically probe the health of the ionosphere from the point of view of space weather. But there's a whole other contingent, and this contingent of people are growing every day. We've got everybody who deals with GNSS and GPS. Uh, you guys have heard of Fitbit watches. I mean, I, I was even in the airport earlier today, and, or earlier yesterday, and I saw you could buy Fitbit watches with the GPS stuff right in the airport, so you can monitor your steps. I guess it's a good place to buy it. I mean, I, you know, you walk for miles in the airport sometimes, so why not, right? Uh, but you also have like GP, you have GPS, uh, high precision GPS uh, farm, you know, farm tractors and uh, precision ag agriculture. You have people who use GPS in their cars and in their drones, the aviation, that kind of industry. And you also have, of course, just your commercial users, everybody who has a cell phone, right? Pretty much everybody knows what GPS is and can can complain about being wrong you know, on your cell phone as much as anyone else. You, all of these things are impacted by space weather. You also have the Aurora tourism industry. You've got the people, at the classic tour, uh, Aurora tour companies as well as the, amateur, the photographers that go out and take pictures of the Aurora all the time. You now have, uh, of course, astronauts. They've been always interested in the Aurora because the Aurora and pictures of the Aurora are some of the most captivating pictures and the most popular of all the images that they display. Even when they're talking about their science and doing their spacewalks, it's still pictures of the aurora, basically of space weather effects that captivate the world. And then of course now you've got uh, space tourism where pretty much anyone getting a Virgin Galactic ticket to fly up to 110,000 feet and just hang out for a little while. People are talking about the, uh, the ISS being hotel ISS because now they're beginning to test actual modules that will be the, the, the forefront, the driver for actually having hotels in space that people could actually stay in for a few days. So that's coming. You've got balloons uh, that, are, that are going up. They're doing manned test flights right now. Worldview, the same, the same company that put uh, Felix Baumgartner, you know, the Red Bull jump, the guy that did the fastest skydive. That company that put him up and Alan Eustace up, who actually broke his world record, that company is now called Worldview, and they are actually testing balloons right now to take people up in a very a five-hour trip up to the rim of the space. And, oh, you want me to get that for you? <laughs> Just kidding. No worries. <laughs> I thought it was mine for a second, so, you know. But they're taking people up to the rim of space now, and and uh, you know are planning to, and you can have a five-hour cruise just kind of hanging out up there. Then they'll they'll jettison the helium balloon, and they'll have an astronaut parasail you and glide you back down to Earth, nice and safe. This is coming. They want to have they want they originally wanted to have the first manned flight with fully up there by this year. Okay, they're a little behind schedule but not much. They're probably going to get people up faster than Virgin Galactic will. So this is coming really quickly. And space weather is absolutely the weather for these types of events. Um, now, of course, we've got satellite providers. You've got the O3B networks. These are satellite internet providers for the other 3 billion people on the planet who don't have internet. It's all going to be provided by satellite. You've got, uh, of course, space enthusiasts who just love anything to do with space. You know, that's why they're cheerleaders raising an astronaut up. And then, of course, all the government agencies, right? You got the, the Air Force and the military, all these, all these 
the, the traditional stakeholders of space weather that absolutely need these things for the FAA to keep airplanes safe and the, the uh, power, national power grids to keep the, the grids online, all of that kind of stuff. And now we're beginning to see meteorologists, just terrestrial weather meteorologists getting online, the ones that want to report aurora, the ones that, that, are, that are beginning to realize that you know, GPS and things actually are, are you know, impacted by this stuff. So as you can see, there is a huge impact on the global economy of things. That is space weather. It's all space weather related. And you guys know more than anybody how much, how important space weather is and what it can do on a daily basis. So what I'm hoping to see here in the next decade or so is, and maybe even sooner, are terrestrial meteorologists who are now trained in space weather, now contacting field reporters, ham radio field ops, and asking you before they go on the air, how are the band conditions today? What are things, what's it like out there? How's the health of the ionosphere, okay? This is a real thing that could very well happen. I'm in communication with the American Meteorological Society as well as the BBC. Meteorologists are talking to me. They are wanting this information and we are trying to formalize this kind of thing. So get ready, because you guys are on the front lines. The only thing I don't want to see though, is if any of you get called as a, as a space weather expert and a meteorologist calls you and wants you to be a field reporter, I don't want to see this. Well, the, the solar wind is blowing like crazy today. We got a solar flare or something. It's, I can hardly stand up. <laughs> Cute, but all right. So what is space weather? Well, essentially, since this is pretty much a review for all you guys, I'll just kind of go through it quickly. Essentially, space weather is a planet's interaction with its host star and the surrounding space environment. But more generally, it occurs at planets and moons and, and uh, other celestial bodies in the universe. In our solar system, it, we see uh, aurora at Jupiter, at Saturn. We even see it at moons like, e, uh, like, Uran or, uh, like uh, Titan and Io, uh, as well as Ganymede. We see all, and we also see uh, space weather affecting uh, planets in ways that we hadn't anticipated, like what we've been seeing at Uranus and Mars. Now, I'm gonna highlight the sun-driven processes because that's really all I have time for. There are other types of space weather, but I'm not gonna go into that, like uh, cosmic rays and uh, interstellar dust and space junk. So let's start with our star. Our star is a giant fusion reactor that drives space weather, and it has a huge amount of energy input or output, rather. The output comes in the form of electromagnetic radiation, which is what bothers you guys the most. That's x-rays all the way down through radio waves. But it also has things like solar wind and plasma. Now, plasma is essentially a gas, but it's not really. It's a gas that's magnetized because you have all of the particles are not neutral. They're charged. And so they, they have to obey the laws of electricity and magnetism. So it gives them very unique properties, which means that they can interact even when they don't hit each other directly when we call a collisionless plasma. And that's the kind of plasma we have out in space. Um, we have, so we have solar wind plasma, magnetic fields, solar flares. We see energetic particles. We call them SEPs in the scientific world. And we have things like coronal mass ejections. So with all of these different types of phenomena, you can imagine the sun is a very difficult thing to capture with all of this stuff going on. And this is why we need to see the sun in so many colors. Anybody ever wonder why, why, why is it a blue sun today? Why are they showing a pink sun? What does a red sun or a yellow sun mean? I don't understand what all this is. Well, if you look at this picture here, this actually represents a single snapshot, essentially a single snapshot in time of the sun. Doesn't look like it, does it? Looks like a whole bunch of different stuff. What we're doing here is peeling an onion. These are the layers of the onion. You start down at the cold temperatures and you're looking at basically the surface of the sun. That's the white light with the sunspots. You go up a little bit higher, a higher layer of the onion, you start seeing the electrical connecti er, uh, activity. That's this one here. Then you start getting up into what is the atmosphere of the sun, and that's the orange sun. And you can actually see there's something coming off it, right? That's a coronal mass ejection. This is kind of the, what we call the transition region, where the, um, the, the surface effects or the surface um, uh, fields and things like that actually begin to interact and become more dynamic as they go into the atmosphere and begin to blow off of the sun. You go a little bit higher, you get to this pink sun, and that's where we see things like coronal holes. A little bit higher, you see magnetic activity. Uh, you can actually really make out loops and, and things in the, in, the, uh, in the corona. And then 
Uh, and then you get into uh, the highest energy, which is, well, not the highest, but close to the highest. This is where you actually see uh, a lot of activity from the actual flare itself. So we actually need to look at all of these different regions to be able to understand what type of phenomena is happening and how it might be affecting Earth down the line. So for you guys, there are basically four types of solar phenomena that affect Earth. The first is a solar flare, and I'll just play a picture of it here, if I can, if it'll play. Oh no, it looks like the movies aren't going to work. Are they? Well, that's a problem. No, because we've got a viewer here. Let me see if I can do really quickly. I'll just go to the movies directly. Okay. So here's a flare, and you'll, I'll try to pause it. Where's pause? Okay. Right when it happens, boom, right there. See that? You'll notice, it's hard to tell on this video, but it gets really grainy, really grainy, because it's actually overloading this, it's saturating the instrument at that point. This is a, a, a high flare. I don't remember if it's an M or an X class, but it's definitely one of those two. This is where you get solar radio bursts from. Okay? Now, solar flares are basically electromagnetic light traveling at the speed of light. It takes about eight minutes to hit Earth. Okay? All they are essentially light, and it's a broadband uh, electromagnetic pulse that then has this decay. Now, sometimes you can get solar energetic particles from this as well, but most of the time it's just pretty much light. This is not what causes aurora. Remember, it gets to Earth in eight minutes, and it's what you guys hear, suddenly the bands are completely wiped out with basically no warning. And that's a solar flare. Now, the slower events that oftentimes happen with uh, solar flares are coronal mass ejections. And that's what you saw in that one picture before. Same thing. This is a big, massive amount of blob of plasma that comes out. This is literally millions of tons of plasma that are blown out. You see it is all curled like that, and this is further out in space. You're now looking out in the coronagraph. You can see that same loop. The sun is now in the corner, in the center of that little picture, I mean, the side of that little picture, and you can see that loop continuing to expand. I hope you can see that in the thing. I'll freeze it here. The reason why you can still see that loop extending out into space, that's actually uh, 15 solar lengths out. The reason why you can see that is because of the magnetism of that plasma. That the fact that it's curled like that shows you that it's kind of trapped into this, in this magnetic tube. And it will continue to reach out as it, go, as it travels to Earth. It will continue to maintain pretty much that shape, which gives us hope that we can actually predict it. But when it hits Earth, it's going to actually interact or not interact, just like fridge magnets. When you, when you try to push them together, they either click or you flip them over and they don't. They repel. Same kind of thing. You've got a fridge magnet there, and the Earth itself is a big fridge magnet. And so you will either get the right kind of connection, and it'll pump all of its energy to, into the Earth's magnetosphere, or it'll just bump like bumper cars and move on by. Okay. So then, let's see if I can get back to this for a second. Did it go away? <laughs> Where did it go? Do I have to start it over again? <coughs> Hopefully it won't. I didn't see that the viewer just disappears on me. Yeah, it started all over. What Did I click it out of it? I guess I did. Okay, so th those are those two phenomena. Now, the next one that you have to worry about are coronal holes. And this is that it's not the hole itself that's so bad. Let's get that out of the way. It's not the hole itself that's so bad. It's actually the fast wind that comes from it. And this is why we need a pink sun, is so that you can actually see when these holes actually reach into the Earth strike zone and will send fast wind Earth you know, towards Earth, and it's kind of like a wave in the water. If the wave is really, you push a lot of fast water behind, you know, behind slow water, it'll actually steepen into a shock, and then that whole impulse when it hits Earth will actually cause a big storm. And it's just the same as if a big uh, CME, a big coronal mass ejection erupted. So we always have to worry about coronal holes, and that's what we're dealing with right now, because the sun is beginning to go to sleep, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Now, those three types of phenomena actually can drive solar radiation storms. A solar flare can launch a bunch of energetic particles. These are radi relativistic particles that can reach Earth quickly. But then the shocks, the shock waves from both the coronal mass ejections and from fast wind can actually drive these, these radiation storms into even bigger, more energetic storms that can last even longer. So as you can see, it's kind of a whole zoo, and we have to kind of keep track of it. It can also get very, very complicated and very confusing 
to know exactly what part of space weather, what particular phenomena might be hitting you at any one time. So you see a lot of that mix up and that's part of the, the thing that makes it difficult for meteorologists to, uh, to report space weather because they don't really understand the differences between these types of phenomena. So let me go to one more video here. So I'm going to kind of show you how it works. And hopefully this is not going to do music. Let's mute that music. OK. So you're looking at the photosphere here. Now that's the white light, what we we're talking about. And you can see a sunspot. So that's the surface of the sun. Now you move up in the onion layers, and you begin to see what's called the chromosphere. This is the transition region between the, the surface and the atmosphere. And in this region, it's very dynamic. You can see what we call a prominence eruption. That is a big coronal mass ejection. Do you see kind of tornado and twisting like that? The reason for that is because it's actually being guided by that magnetic field, like I told you. Now, if we pull further out, you can see actually the solar wind in what's called the coronagraph view. You can see the sun in the middle, and then you've got this occulting disk that blocks out the sun's light except for the atmosphere. So now we're going to take one of these events of the solar flares you can see in the, in the, the green or the blue sun. You can see that big flash of light. In 171 angstroms, which is the yellow sun, you can actually see the blast waves. This shows you the magnetic field lines. And you can actually see it just kind of shake and wiggle. See, did you see that blast wave right there? So we actually study all of these massive, almost like earthquakes all of a sudden when these things happen. Now here, uh, these, are, these cadences are about 15, well, this will take hours. Uh, but it's cadences of about 15 to 20 minutes per The eruption itself will take place in maybe an hour or two. Um, okay, so now we're watching one of these things blasting out. This is a solar storm or a CME blasting out into space. Now, if it were to hit Venus, you'd have this thing just basically slamming right into Venus. You'd have particles hitting the atmosphere, which is what happens, and it actually strips away part of the atmosphere because Venus is not protected. But when you go to Earth, it's a totally different scenario. Remember I was telling you about those fridge magnets, right? The same surface extends out into space and it actually forms this shield as you can see the particles are being deflected on the front side. Now it really is just like a fridge magnet. The main component of this field is a dipole field. It's got a north pole and a south pole and it's spring and it wiggles all the time. So when you put this this big field into this, the, the uh, solar wind, this thing is going to start getting compressed at the front end and it's going to start elongating the back end form what we call the magnetosphere. It kind of looks like a comet, but it's a magnetic comet. And when you have a, and this back part's called a magnet, when you have a big storm that smashes into the front of it, believe it or not, the, it just kind of strips off the top of this field, and all the energy is actually thrown in the tail. And the tail will stretch, 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 and then it will snap back. And when it snaps back, it shoots particles both north and south. And those particles end up causing the energized the ionosphere in those areas cause the aurora. But you also get radiation, energetic particles heating up in the radiation belts, and you just basically get the, the entire atmosphere lit up like a Christmas tree. This is why you guys have so much trouble on the bands, especially at night, because that magnetic tail is always in the night sky. So you're always getting problems with particle shooting. And this right here is SDO. This is the spacecraft that's giving us all that, that information, all the different colors of the sun. This spacecraft's in trouble right now. We have a senior review, and the review did not do well. We've got to keep the spacecraft operational, but the scientists are fighting right now to keep this puppy alive because, uh, you know, NASA has only has so much money, and they want to go on and do different missions. So we, we're, as, as far as our scientist community is concerned, we've really got a, a big fight on our hands. All right, let me get back to this. So that should be it for the movies. <laughs> The, the, imaging, the, the imaging for this is, are, are at completely different uh, frequencies, as you can see. We're, well, I have it as temperature, but we take it at different frequencies. So we're actually using um, the, the, like Lyman, out, you know, we're, we're using different frequencies of light that we actually have filters. So it's, it's, it's light, but it's not like visible light, as you can tell. And I, ha I, can, I can show you more details if you want to chat with me afterwards. Okay, so 
if anyone's been to NOAA, the Space Weather Prediction Center, they have scales and basically to let you know how bad space weather can be. They've got three sets of scales for geomagnetic storms, that's the G scale, solar radiation storms, that's the S scale, and then radio blackouts, that's the R scale. These scales are good for the United States. They're not necessarily good for anywhere else. So if you leave the United States and go do contesting somewhere else, you may not think these scales are so accurate. So just keep that in mind. Space weather does vary globally. But what can a typical solar event do? Well, here's a picture of the Space Weather Prediction Center. This is basically where we get most, if not all, of our data. Uh, and here on the left-hand side is a picture, or is a, is a plot of radiation, uh, particle radiation data up on top and solar flare ra radiation data on the bottom. Uh, you can see a couple pictures of some uh, M-class flare and an X-class flare. Now, you don't have to read all of this stuff or really even know it. I just wanted to show you that this is one week's worth of data near solar maximum. And as you can see, there are one, two, three solar flares. Uh, I, sh I needed a pointer, but I didn't have one. So those big peaks on the bottom there, those are solar flares. And the top, you can see two big humps. Those are two radiation storms. So in the span of a week, we got three moderate to large solar flares and two moderate to large uh, radiation storms all on top of each other. And this is a problem for us because with space weather, that's typically what happens. You get a sunspot on the sun that's a bad actor. I mean, it's mad. And it comes into Earth view and it just starts firing off storms and it fires off a flare and it fires off a CME and it fires off radiation storms and it just keeps firing and firing and firing until it rotates out of view to the sun's backside. So we will get one to two weeks worth of nasty stuff just hurled at us constantly. And that is what makes space weather so frustrating. It's not these Carrington events. It's actually just the, the superposition of event after event after event. So here's an example of from that set of data I just showed you. Uh, this was uh, communications disruptions for the FAA. Now you can see here on the, on the back, and I, I forgot to do it earlier because I was flipping out of movies, but we're talking about radiation storms. You can see the, the, um, the map of the world there. Hopefully you can see that. There's two sets of maps of the world. And you don't have to be a physicist to know that red is bad. <laughs> right? so, so this is actually, it's, the, it's uh, the model called DRAP. It shows the D layer of the ionosphere. And when this, these two, the, the top shows are the beginning of the radiation storm plus a solar flare. The solar flare is the circle part. That shows where the day side was, so where the solar flare could actually impact things. And to be honest, when you look at these maps, for those in the know, when you look at these maps, don't look necessarily for just the red part. Look for where the colors are changing dramatically. Those gradients in the changes in color, that's where you're going to have the biggest problems. Not where the thing is not changing color. It's where you change color. So the gray line, as you can tell, the area where it, right before it goes black, that region in there where it's changing color rapidly, that is a magic area, but it's also a trouble area. And it's a, it's a trouble area for GPS as well. So during this particular solar flare, the FAA Radio Communication Center reported that the Central East Pacific and the Central West Pacific regions were, quote, impacted severely by solar activity between 1830 Zulu and 1930 Zulu on the 27th of January due to the R3 solar flare radio blackout. Thirteen requests were received from air traffic control for overdue position reports. Anybody know what that means? Thirteen of them. They lost 13 flights. No idea where they were for about half an hour. No clue. Okay. From the radiation storm, there were several polar flights altered due to the S3 radiation storm. Major airline reported that some of our polar flights, but not all, have reported HF comm outages over the past three nights. Radiation storms last for five days. Okay. So the more polar flights we have, the more the FAA is being impacted. And this is not an un uncommon. During solar maximum, it's a big issue. And I'm not even going into the fact that the crews, imagine the pilots and the crews, right? Did you know in the European Union, they do not require any radiation monitoring of their crew at all or their pilots. They don't even have to keep logs. And in the United States, all they have to do is keep logs and they use models and say, well, what's your dose? What's your radiation dose from the storm? Oh, well, well, if not, it wasn't the radiation storm, it's just cosmic rays. Well, yeah, but there's an S3 radiation storm. That's going to up your factor by two orders of magnitude. You're going to get, instead of one or two chest x-rays, you're getting one or two CAT scans. Okay, so this stuff is serious. It's also serious for, for frequent flyers. 
you know, people who fly high altitude and, and uh, uh, high latitude, as well as people who fly long distances and frequently. You know, they're getting bigger doses than they realize. So these are the things we're trying to change. And, that was, and by the way, that was just a regular storm. So what can a super storm event do? Okay. I'm not even going to go into the super, super storm, which is the Carrington. This is, this is bit bad enough. This is a, uh, an event. We call this our standard candle. This is our event from 1989, uh, March 6 through 15. This is an X-15 flare followed by a CME. The last one I showed you, the biggest flare was an X-2. Okay. And, and flares are, are on a Richter, like a Richter scale. It's a logarithmic scale. So you can imagine how much more powerful it is. Weather satellites lost images for hours. The Tedris uh, 1 commsat had over 250 anomalies. That was a military commsat. It had over 250 anomalies. The Space Shuttle Discovery fuel sensor failed. And Radio Free Europe, it was disrupted. The, 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 radio, you know, the radio, the transmission. It was disrupted. They thought it was a Soviet jam event. Remember, it's 1989. The Que Quebec, Hydro-Quebec power grid shut down. And the James Bay network serving over 6 million people was offline for nine hours. This caused the Toronto stock market to close. Okay. They had brilliant aurora displays as far as Texas and Florida that you could read by. Not just see, you could read by them. As a matter of fact, here is a uh, DOD uh, F9 weather satellite that's made to take pictures during the day. Okay. Do you see all this white? It's saturated. That's how bright the aurora was completely saturated this, this uh, satellite. And then there's been many other examples of superstorms in the space. Anybody remember last year in November how the uh, radio burst took out uh, Copenhagen? Anybody remember that? This is, we're supposed to be on a slow, a small solar cycle activity level. And we're coming down on solar minimum. And the, net, the, the airline had to shut down, I mean, the airport had to shut down for several hours. So, you know, this stuff happens all the time. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I don't want to spend too much time. You guys know pretty much what the ionosphere is. Uh, basically, being a charged plasma layer, it would be neutral except it gets charged by the sun's UV. And this facilitates radio propagation. Uh, and then, of course, during the storms, you can get the, the particles coming in from the north and the south that end up causing aurora. Now, I will talk much more about uh, ionospheric propagation and how space weather affects it in the antenna form on Friday afternoon. I don't have enough time to talk about it here. So here's just a little bit of a, a peek um, to, to kind of you, get you your juices flowing, get your, get your, wet your appetite. Most of everybody, I think, probably thinks that, that you know, when you're trained to think about the ionosphere, you kind of think of it as this smooth layer, you know, the F layer, the E layer. You think of them more, more or less smooth layers, maybe sporadic, but smooth. Well, they're not, not at all. Very wiggly, very turbulent. And you have a lot of things. I was talking to a, an atmospheric physicist just, just yesterday, and I was talking about how the neutral atmosphere really ends up making a big difference to, uh, to, to the ionosphere. Because you, think, you have things like atmospheric heating instabilities that come up and cause plasma bubbles. They cause the whole uh, structure of these things to undulate and change all the time. And you have waves in the neutral particle regions. You have currents in charged particle regions. You have all sorts of things that cause really what we have, uh, it, for, for, which what's a big deal for uh, GPS is signal refraction, because you can actually get a bent signal. And all of the GPS receivers expect a signal to be straight. So when you bend a signal, the satellite that they thought was right there was actually here. So what does that mean? That means they think they're here, and they're actually way over there. So it can make huge, huge differences in your geolocation. And for imagine flying a drone. Imagine a UAV pilot flying their drone, and suddenly this drone starts fishbowling and starts doing one of these numbers, like this. 18 feet vertical change, 30 feet horizontal change. Think I'm lying? I've got proof. Anybody want to see it? I'll show it to you. This is a satellite operator in Scotland showed me the telemetry from his, from his drone, and it happened during the Mother Day, Mother's Day storm last year. So, and oh, by the way, that was only 30 miles away from the uh, Amazon Air uh, drone facility, where they're beginning to actually deliver packages by drone. Anybody see something wrong here, or is it just me? Do you see why amateur radio operators are the space weather field reporters of the future? Do you guys see how important a role you play in all of this? You really do, and I again bow to all of you because you guys are on the front lines of space weather. 
So I won't have time to go into the audible interference, but what I will talk a little bit about is solar variability and where we are now. I've gotten a lot of questions about the recent solar cycles that are changing and that making predictions more complicated. We are in a Dalton-like minimum where the cycle is slower, where the sun is quieter, and we have slower currents beneath the surface. Uh, and that's causing a lower activity maximum. Uh, the solar maximum, this, this cycle has been double peaked, and it's been double peaked in a strange way. Usually it's the first peak that's bigger and the second peak is smaller, so you can see it's reversed. There's a lot of weird stuff going on. We had multiple uh, predictions. We had one in September 20, 2008, one in July 29, or 2009, and one in April 2011. And as you can see, we're shifting the solar maximum out uh, with every prediction. Turned out that the one in the July 2009 was probably the closest in terms of uh, amplitude as well as uh, where the location of the, well, not really the location of solar max. It ended up being in 2014. So you can see a scientists still have a lot to learn about, these, about the sun and about the solar cycles. So we're not really sure what's going to be happening next. Again, in the antenna form, I will talk a little bit more about what the trend is. And there's some surprises there. And I'll talk one last thing. Do I have like a minute or two? OK, good. I, I see you and I get nervous. <laughs> so. So where are we when it comes to space weather forecasting? Well, really, you'd think that you know because we have these space weather prediction centers around the world, they've been developed mainly as a response to these superstorms that cause problems every now and again. Uh, we have models that predict fields, CME transit, magnetospheric responses, solar storm alerts, radio blackouts, solar radiation storms, FAA alerts, space ground telescopes. We monitor it 24-7. Even on the backside, we have spaceship Earth networks looking at cosmic rays. <sighs> We're good, right? Not even close, not even close. We don't have global coverage. We can't look at the sun all the time. We don't get telemetry that's good enough to get us the cadence of data that we need to be able to make good predictions. We don't even begin to have the computing power that we need to add all the physics to the models to make them realistic. We are so bad. Do you remember the 60s? Anybody remember the 60s? <laughs> Oh, man, I envy you guys. I would have loved to have been alive next to the 60s. David Bowie? Oh, come on. <laughs> but this is where we are in space weather. Harry Volkman was the first one to pinch. He called it pinching. There's another British term for you. Pinched tornado warnings right off of military bases and began to broadcast them to the public. And everybody went, no, 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 you'll incite a panic, right? Instead, he got 1,600 letters saying, thank you, please keep doing what you're doing. We feel so much safer. Because it's much better than just a tornado siren, which is what they were getting before. Well, that's kind of where we are with space weather. We get tornado sirens. That's all we get. So what have I done? I've kind of pinched the, 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 broad, the, the data and the information that is basically made for the military. SWPSI does not serve the public as much as they would like to. Their main stakeholders are the military. That's why they can't give you the information they want to give you and the data products they want to give you and be as responsive as they want. They are chained by the stakeholders that need their data the way that they already give it. So I'm doing it. I'm pinching their, broad, their, their data, pinching their reports and their forecasts, and I'm trying to put it into a format that is good for everybody. And that's why I'm working with the AMS. That's why I'm working with the BBC. I'm trying to make this a much more global thing that is useful for everybody, because this is what is going to matter. Because our future relies on predicting space weather. That's my last chart. Reliance on space is advancing. We have wireless technologies. There are six billion mobile phones in the world today, and it's growing, growing, growing. There are more mobile phones in the world today than there are toilets. I can actually bring up an article at Time, from Time Magazine that talks about it. Can you believe that? that more people have cell phones than have working toilets on this planet. <laughs> GPS, GNSS receivers, these satellite service providers are exploding. We have self-driving cars. California law was passed in 2012 that a Google car can share public roads. They are using GPS. I'm not as afraid of those because they have LiDAR maps. But I am very afraid of the UAVs, because in 2015, drones were allowed to share commercial airspace. You can't map the sky with LIDAR. They've got to rely on GPS and collision avoidance, and that's it. How do you, avo how do, you do collision avoidance when you're doing this, when you're fish bowling? 
Space tourism, Worldview already talked about them, launching uh, manned balloon flights in 2017. Uh, you can go to their website and you can see almost daily reports of that stuff. So, and we have national power grids and other government agencies, and yet we still have, with all of this stuff coming online, and Amazon Prime and all this kind of thing, you still have, look at the BBC, solar flare races towards Earth. Eight minutes, folks, eight minutes is how long it takes a solar flare to hit Earth. It's the CME that takes days and will cause aurora. So they still get it wrong. You know, all of these guys need to be trained. And that's what I'm trying to help do. So if you need more information, uh, you can visit me, spaceweatherwoman.com. I'm revamping my site, but it'll be up online really soon. Uh, you can also catch me on YouTube. Uh, and I also give updates on Twitter. You can also just Google Space Weather Woman or Tamitha Scove, and you'll find me. And I do answer questions. Uh, I'm a little bit slow at it, but I will get to you. So please feel free to. Uh, to reach out and contact me. Thank you.